our last talk for this um, first morning session will be um, by Jason Song. And um, sorry, where am I here? Um, Jason is a senior paintings conservator at the Smithsonian's MCI. She has an MS degree in art conservation from the Winterthur University of Delaware program um, and an MS in uh, chemistry from Bowling Green State University. She focuses on conservation and preventive care of modern and contemporary art, and her research interests include instrumental analysis of modern materials with FTIR, Hyrox microscope, and SEM. In her most recent and ongoing collaboration with the National Museum of African American History and Culture, she led a team to analyze and restore the entire collection of paintings in the museum's visual art gallery. Um, today, um, she will be speaking about a case study, the structural conservation of a painting affected by metal soaps formation. Please welcome Justin. Good morning, everyone. Um, such a pleasure to be here. This is my first WAAC meeting. Um, it's wonderful to see your friends and colleagues I haven't seen for a while, so it's wonderful. I really enjoy it. And uh, Salt Lake City is just beautiful, all this beautiful mountain, the air is so clean. It just, yeah, I think I'm coming back. So um, just get to the, um, my talk for the day um, is a case study. So I have been involving and working with uh, National Museum of African American History and Culture since 2007. Uh, my job at the MCI, can you hear me all right? A little closer, is that better? Okay. Um, I mostly work uh, with the museum at Smithsonian that do not have a painting conservator. Uh, my client will be including National Museum, American Indian Museum, Air and Space, American History, uh, Latino Center. For a while, I, for 10 years, I was um, exhibition conservator for the Latino Center. So um, made a lot of great friends, people working in fabrication and all different kind of museum. I really like the challenge and working with the team. So these are the big, um, some example of the painting that we restore, um, we take care of it for the, um, the Visual Art Gallery at National Museum of African American History and Culture. And uh, we also help out the installation last year. Uh, we just celebrated the anniversary a couple of days ago. Uh, we help out the installations, and the planning is takes for a long time, but um, when we're actually on site for three weeks, including hang every painting and put the security system behind, working with the security, working the housekeeping, working with everyone. So it was a w wonderful experience, and people come back, um, realize that we had such a wonderful team, and most of the people help out is my colleague from my years working in Smithsonian. They, people just work together. It's wonderful. Um, these are the um, um, a little visual image of the gallery is rather small, um, but the material is very challenging. Um, what we try to do is, um, for the project, we have intern and contractor working on this. Um, what we try to do is m do the most uh, initial investigation by the conservator. And for that, we can form formulate our question and then take to the next level working with the conservation scientists. I mean, they're all busy, have other commitments, so we try to do as much as we can for the initial investigation. This is one of the machines, uh, we got this a couple years ago, it's really wonderful, Hyrox, quite, quite a, a museum uh, have this, conservation facility had this uh, Hyrox 3D image, we do a lot of investigation close out with this. So right out, I'm just mentioning all the contributors to help out with this particular painting case study. Uh, we, as you can see, we even, including the people in natural history who did all, most of the SEM work for this project. Um, for the stretcher part, we have people uh, working in fabrication. 
mount maker, uh, cabin maker, and uh, furniture conservator. So without all these people, there's no project. Couldn't possible have anything um, done. So this is the painting, um, Robin Eagle's Nest by Robert Scott Duncanson. The painting was 1856. This painting come from, come from a private uh, owner, actually never was on the market. Um, so it was very lucky for the curator was able to secure this painting. The only thing it, this is a little before treatment shot, the only thing the owner did is to have the painting spiff up a little bit, which means probably some sort of coating was put on it. And that's the one caused a lot of yellowing and darkening. This is what the back painting looks like. It's just incredible. We were able to get a painting without any lining canvas from uh, 1856. But you can see uh, over time the, de the, uh, the impact for the relative humidity, temperature throughout this, and some of this uneven uh, color probably come from the varnish was put on. And uh, the stretcher bar is really stable, have no problem in terms of condition, no, no insect damage, was in great conditions. So we were lucky to have um, the Im imaging specialist to do uh, infrared, just looking around and uh, you realize that uh, these two ego almost add up to the drama, the whole composition probably is kind of last minute. Um, decision because it's very thin it painted was on top of all these rock formations um, so there are little um, composition changes in the foreground uh, this painting is supposed where I understand it is the location in Cincinnati and um, I live in Ohio for a while and I think I visited Cincinnati a couple times I don't remember I've seen these rock formations, um, but anybody can tell me I'm wrong about it, but we've been looking around and people from Cincinnati, have you seen rock formation like this? Duncanson made this painting after his trip in Europe, so he knew a really uh, wonderful uh, traditional um, landscape uh, from uh, when he's looking around in, in you know, in, from his trip in Europe. So all this foreground, the, uh, the vintage point, all that. So uh, he probably improvised a little bit uh, for this wonderful landscape. So I don't know, um, this image is a little dark here, but can you see, this is a, when we look at the painting on the surface, you can see the white dot. Can you see it all right? Okay, I, I hope this is, uh, anyway. This is a close-up look of this white dot. And um, we, initial investigation, we realized that this painting has a lead ground. And uh, from talking to geologists uh, at the Natural History, they know there's a mine for lead in Cincinnati, Ohio Valley area. And also the lead also have a component of zinc in there. But for my initial investigation, we said, okay, this is lead, this is probably lead soap. Well, the only thing when we start poking the, uh, the, this protrusion, it's very, very soft. Um, I mean, I have poked a couple of lead soap in my life. I don't think it's this so soft. So it gets me kind of worried about what is this. Also, it can, this white pus can easily be removed, can shear off the top. So you can see some of them already. Um, the top is shear off, you can still see the ground. Um, so since we um, not really able to take painting, you know, all over the place have to get permission. So we try to take most of the um, sample around the tacking edge also all this pus also extended to the attacking edge. So in some way we were lucky to able to get sample from the attacking edge. So we tried to uh, study um, 
as much as you can what it is. So you can see from this uh, images uh, we shot in the studio, you can see uh, the, the, um, this incredible uh, crack patterns on four corners throughout the center. So this is an image by uh, a wonderful uh, imaging specialist. So you can see um, the crack pattern but also you can see the, where the stretcher bar is. But in addition, there's another one here. So at some point, this painting was stacking uh, with another painting. It's a smaller in dimensions. Um, but look at this crack. This is absolutely amazing. Uh, and then with the crack and there was a little pus. So give us a lot of a pause what to do with this. Um, so we started a lot of investigation, and uh, we were very lucky um, to able to have all the people to help out. And this is just goes through the list uh, of the instrumentation and technique that we use. So with the FTIR, um, we were able to identify the pus is actually zinc soap. Uh, this doubly is, is a, um, a typical example of zinc oleate and zinc linogate. Um, this is also to show we actually have lead in there. The lead is the ground, but the pus is zinc. So we also take this image into XRD to confirm the presence of lead and zinc. Oh, this is very interesting. This is not what it's supposed to look like. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, what happened? <laughs> so anyway, we were able to identify, you have to kind of trust me. <laughs> I must be able to find a technique to repeat this. Uh, anyway, we find the zinc, the high, peak is the zinc, the low one is the lead. So there's a mixture in zinc and lead. And you can see this white cloud. This is the, the lead ground. Uh, the, this are the zinc. So the protrusion we saw are the zinc. There's no, um, they're not lead. There's some portion of it, but it's not. So, the chemist uh, took this further to do the XRF mapping, and you can see all these high spots are matching with the zinc. So the reason we uh, spend so much time to figure it out, because really wish is the zinc soap. I mean, less soap, not zinc, because we've been looking at the literature and couldn't still figure out why only the zinc soap, not the less soap. Uh, we find uh, no less soap. So with this one with the, uh, SEM imaging, we actually have a satellite view of the cross sections. So imagine this is a view looking from down. So at the center of this pus, you can see this is uh, the zinc soap. Uh, um, not a whole lot of pigment in here. And there are pigment on the side. So we were able to, there are three spots that we studied there uh, from the, the soap, the satellite view, as you remember, that is all zinc. There's no lead in there. Around the edges, the, all the pigments, not the soap, just the pigment, is most of the lead. So another um, color thing to um, the mapping with the color, you can see that the zinc is in the center, and the lead is on the outside. The pigment is lead, and the center is soap, and the soap is zinc. So it took us a while to try to convince ourselves that uh, the soap is zinc, not lead, and uh, then we know, then our challenge left, what are we gonna do with this? information and how do we perceive uh, our treatment. 
The challenge is, is, uh, is the, the protrusion uh, breaks off very easily. So any kind of treatment involving pressure, weight, uh, water, solvent, all of this, I, we have to be extremely careful about it. Um, and uh, the deformation has to be corrected because uh, that's the, the request from the curator, what, that's what they expected. And the frame, even though it's not the ideal frame, but come with the painting, so the curator decided to keep the frame. And uh, the stretcher is still sturdy. Uh, we can reuse it. And to fit the existing stretcher into the frame, I think is the way we should go about it. So since we all have all this restriction, uh, so we had to figure out what to do. We cannot really put on a hot table um, couldn't do the flattening by weight, anything. So we uh, was able to get a team to work together. We figured out we probably have to do the mechanical corrections in some way. So uh, it leads us to a designing a stretcher bar that we can correct the deformation have to, without doing all this lining. So we started this uh, called the deep TWP2, it's by me, a uh, furniture painting conservator, Don William, which most a lot of you know him as furniture conservator, and Rick Pilasara, who is a master cabinet maker, and uh, Patterson, so there's two P there, so that P2. Um, so we presented this at the AIC meeting in 2013, and uh, I understand the post screen is still in progress. Hopefully, if you want to know more information about the TW2, TWP2 stretcher bar, all the information, detail, and the drawing all in the post screen. I hope it come out pretty soon because it's been a while. So the idea is we are inspired by um, um, the idea is if we can move the stretcher bar independently, uh, not the bar, not the interdependent by by axial x and y when you do the key. And we did try the key, try to correct this. It's just not very effective in the center. I think part of it because of the size. So we want something that we can move independently uh, in the X and the Y directions. So what composed of this is, um, so we have, a, in, this is aluminum, and all the parts that we uh, material order from McMaster, um, while, we, while we have a, a U channel and T channel element were fitted together with deal rings. You know, one of the very tough uh, plastic that they use it in the flicker. The, um, for my initial research uh, on the plastic uh, in my early career in Smithsonian, there was two plastic impressed me the most, Bakelite and deal rings. I know they use a lot in the nuclear power um, uh, manufacturer because they can take the heat very well and it's very stable. So we, we choose to use the material uh, to do part of the plastic in cooperation with this metal structure. So you should actually by adjust the tension, moving the stretcher bar just by turn the thumb screw right here and here and here. So um, this is one of the test samples that we did uh, just to show um, what the back looks like. So we designed the two things. A, use the uh, TWP2 as an insert to work with the existing uh, stretcher bar, but also uh, as an artist grade material. You can see from the, the turn screw here, and also you can see the, the plastic, the T bar, the moving smoothly through the combination of the plastic and the metal. Uh, sometimes if we needed extra uh, support, we would have a crossbar. So we started study, try to figure out uh, 
you know, how does TWP2 work and how does it compare with the key uh, stretcher bar? So we use a very low-tech uh, experiment. We build this box from um, material from Home Depot and uh, we put the silica cycle for 14 cycles, uh, once per week, um, so from zero to hundreds. So for the wooden stretcher bar, uh, within the 13, within the 14 cycle, we actually were able to produce this stress from the corner and we were very surprised because we thought the project would end you know, a couple years, but we actually were able to produce in 14 cycle, a um, couple months. So with the key out in just such a short time, then we actually will produce a couple more, uh, uh, there's cracks on the, in the corner. But for the, remember the, one of our experimental things is, is uh, 30 by 30, and by smaller uh, uh, stretchers, 12 by 12, none of this affect them. So and at the end, you know, the size matter, the stress and strain and the size does matter. So for the artist grade, we were not, we, we did not uh, find the cracks at the corners. But we do have one or two imper imperfect crack in the center. We probably contribute to like human error or the fabric, we didn't ascend it properly. But at least we're happy it was not in the corner. So we did a little comparisons. Uh, uh, we don't have any more uh, equipment to do this uh, stress and strain measurement, so this is a lot of hypothetical um, theory things. What, what we find out is by with the TWP2, we were able to uh, adjust the tension evenly and independently. I think that's the key. The stress on the corner is still there, is, is minimum, compared to the r traditional curable structure bar, but it's still there. So you can see we start to clean the, remove the varnish, um, cut the corner, varnish is removed. This is, we use this as an insert, uh, working with the existing uh, stretcher bar, and we have to put an um, extra uh, crossbar to make sure it can hang properly. So the painting and before and after, uh, this painting right now is in a gallery. And so the painting was conserved in 2014 complete. The frame was conserved 2015. The painting was in storage for uh, 15 to 16. And it was installed in the gallery uh, September 23rd, 2016. And we keep out the regular maintenance and the survey once a month. Um, since November 2016, every month we go there look at the painting. And the canvas is still stable and tall. But all through this time, we never have to adjust the, the screw. And uh, the, the zinc soap are intact and it's still there. If you really put a strong light, you can see it, but with the light adjustment, um, it looks okay, and we have not seen any more zinc soap growth, which I have no explanation for that. Uh, just maybe just good luck, uh, <laughs> a good environment. That's it. <laughs>